Hello, and welcome to the History of African Philosophy by T.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, In a Class of Their Own, Early African American Socialism. There's a good piece of advice to be found on the 1972 Funkadelic album, America Eats Its Young. If you don't like the effects, don't produce the cause. Suppose, for instance, that there is an outbreak of malaria where you live. The disease is spread by mosquitoes, who infest your community because it is located right next to a swamp. Mosquitoes are just the occasion for malaria, and it's really this marshland that is the cause, so it needs to be drained to eliminate the problem. We didn't invent this example, and neither did Funkadelic. It was used in a speech given in 1919 by A. Philip Randolph as an analogy to explain lynching. Most people assume that race prejudice is the cause of this equally deadly social illness, but in fact, there is an underlying cause that usually escapes notice, capitalism. Randolph, you see, was a socialist who traced not just lynching, but all the bias, oppression, and disadvantages of the African Americans of his day to exploitation by the owners of capital. He had been converted to the socialist cause as a student, after devouring Marx the way children read Alice in Wonderland, as he said. But socialism wasn't kid stuff. President Woodrow Wilson called Randolph the most dangerous Negro in America. Wilson had a graduate degree in history, and wrote books on American history in the 19th century, so ideally, he knew that black socialism went much further back than Randolph. The first African American to come to prominence as a socialist was Peter H. Clark. After coming into contact with Marxism through the German community in Cincinnati, he put forth radical views in the 1870s, notably the abolition of private ownership of capital. Probably no one thought that Clark was the most dangerous Negro in America, though. He avowed that he was against violent words and violent deeds, and stepped away from the socialist movement in 1879 to avoid losing his job as a superintendent of colored schools. Nor did Clark yet grasp the potential of socialist theory as a tool for analyzing the special challenges facing black people in America. For him, the whole working class was in the same predicament, to the point that he at one point referred to slaves, white and black. That would remain the socialist party line, in the truest sense of that phrase, up until the time of World War I. Eugene Debs, the leading white socialist of the early 20th century, once said, We have nothing special to offer the Negro. The Socialist Party is the party of the whole working class, regardless of color. As late as 1917, an editorial set out the position of the industrial workers of the world as follows. To the IWW, there is no race problem, there is only a class problem. The economic interest of all workers, be they white, black, brown, or yellow, are identical. Which, it must be said, is hardly surprising. It would be a significant revision to orthodox Marxist theory to admit that racial oppression is separate from economic class-based oppression. As we'll see shortly, even the African-American socialists did not want to say this. But the white socialists were, for a long time, unwilling to admit that capitalism affected black workers in a unique way, or if they did admit it, they took no steps to do anything about it. There were tactical considerations involved here, too. White activists worried that if the Socialist Party were too closely associated with the cause of black liberation, it would be absolutely dead so far as America is concerned. Besides which, a number of white socialists were outright racists. These were men like Victor Berger, who considered blacks an inferior race and was staunchly opposed to immigration to America because it posed a threat to white workers' interests, a stance he presented as a defense of Caucasian civilization. It did not help matters that black workers, as they were generally excluded from unions, sometimes went to work as strike breakers or scabs, something that outraged labor organizers. Given all this, you might think that no African American would want to have anything to do with socialism, yet some of the most brilliant and rhetorically gifted black thinkers of the age were socialists. Foremost among them was Hubert Harrison. Like several other major Africana thinkers of this period, he came from the Caribbean, in this case, the island of St. Croix. At the age of 17, and in the year 1900, he came to the United States, where he was confronted by deep racial prejudice, such as he had never known growing up. Within only a few years, he was spreading the gospel of socialism, 
At first, he used relatively mild rhetoric, adhering to the Socialist Party mantra that black workers demanded only economic and not social equality, and reassuring his audiences that these workers are not given to strikes or to walkouts. But Marxist theory told him that the racial strife he saw in America must have an underlying economic cause. He insisted that there is nothing innate in race prejudice, rather it is fostered by those who have something to gain by it. His analysis of the problem is nicely set out in a collection of his essays, published in 1917 under the title The Negro and the Nation. For Harrison, the Negro problem is essentially an economic problem, with its roots in slavery, past and present. As this suggests, he draws a straight line between the history of American slavery and the parlous state of black Americans in his own day, writing, We have simply changed one form of slavery for another. Then it was chattel slavery, now it is wage slavery. The only difference is that before abolition, the capitalist masters owned the workers, whereas now they own the tools used by the workers. As we can see from these passages, Harrison is not departing from socialist theory in his account of racial oppression. Rather, he is extending the application of that theory. The same move was made by like-minded agitators, such as George Washington would be, who in 1905 made a remark that would be right at home in today's American political discourse. In the days of chattel slavery, the masters had a patrol force to keep the Negroes in their place and protect the interests of the masters. Today, the capitalists use the police for the same purpose. But there's a philosophical puzzle here. According to socialist theory, workers are exploited by those who own the means of production. They pay laborers a sufficient wage to keep them alive and working, but appropriate much of the value of what has been produced in the form of profit. This legal form of large-scale theft victimizes anyone who works in a capitalist industry. So why would it result in special forms of oppression, which would affect black people in particular? This line of thought, along with the aforementioned racism, was precisely the rationale that led the Socialist Party to proclaim its so-called colorblindness. But as Harrison noted, Race prejudice might be a very useful tool for the capitalists. This is because it divides the workers into two groups, white and black, so as to prevent them from joining forces to fight for their common interests. The same point was well made by another socialist activist of the time who also hailed from the Caribbean, in this case the island of Nevis, namely Cyril V. Briggs. In the newspaper he founded, The Crusader, he wrote that the economic factor enters into the race problem only to the same extent that it enters into the relations of members of a single group, save that the existence of two opposing groups gives the capitalists, both groups, unusual opportunities at economic exploitation. Which brings us back to Randolph's explanation of lynching. In his view, this violence was simply a byproduct of the hatred stoked by the ruling class amongst the white working class, who were encouraged to see their fellow black workers as subhuman enemies rather than potential allies. The same goes for race riots, as was argued in the newspaper run by Randolph and his collaborator, Chandler Owen. The reason, they wrote, does not lie in race prejudice but in the class struggle. Blame your capitalist system. So this analysis was adopted by all the leading African-American socialists of the period. Harrison went further, though, by connecting this account of racial strife to bold claims about the philosophy of race. He argued that even the sorting of people into a hierarchy of races is an artificial means invented to exploit them more easily. This, he argued, is why we do not find talk of race before modern times. He gave the King James Bible as an example. The notion of racial inferiority is merely, as he put it, the mental reflex of a social fact. Eventually, this message began to resonate with some white socialists. An early proponent of outreach to potential supporters in the black community was Isaac Max Rubinoff. He tried to win the allegiance of the most prominent African-American intellectual of the day, W.E.B. Du Bois, who responded with typical nuance, while I would scarcely describe myself as a socialist, still I have much sympathy with the movement and I have many socialistic beliefs. This was in 1904. Du Bois would, some years later, begin describing himself as a socialist, and we will certainly explore his deepening commitment to Marxism in a future episode. For now, what is most relevant is his remark challenging the Socialist Party in 1913, the Negro problem is the great test of the American socialist. Eugene Debs eventually passed the test. Moving away from his neutrality on questions of race, 
he began to speak out on this topic in 1915, leading a boycott of the Ku Klux Klan movie epic Birth of a Nation and accusing his fellow socialists of cowardice for failing to fight racism. For Hubert Harrison, though, this was too little too late. Having concluded that the white organized labor movement has been, and still is, pronouncedly anti-Negro, he turned away from the goal of cooperation with white workers. While they were refusing to diagnose our case, he wrote, we diagnosed it ourselves, and now that we have prescribed the remedy, race solidarity, they come to us with their prescription, class solidarity. Another socialist colleague of Harrison's, W.A. Domingo, once commented that black people effectively formed a distinct caste in American life. Deploying his socialist conceptual tools once again, Harrison was able to explain this. Labor unions are the most powerful means by which workers' rights are protected. But African Americans were excluded from these by racist white workers who would even go on strike to avoid having to work together or on equal terms with blacks. Their goal, said Harrison, was that no black man shall hold a job that any white man wants. Though he would have preferred a single unified labor movement, he concluded that this was impossible because the capitalist stratagem of fomenting white hatred against black members of the same class was too successful. But he did not give up his political and philosophical beliefs. As one modern-day scholar has observed, although American socialism did not keep faith with Hubert Harrison, Harrison kept faith with socialism. He did so by organizing black-only labor groups in the face of criticism from Du Bois and others who accused him of yielding to the logic of segregation. A. Philip Randolph seems to have drawn similar conclusions. He at one time hoped for one big union that would include all workers, and compared racial dissension among the working class to a white dog and a black dog fighting over a bone, while the yellow dog of the upper class ran away with all the profits. But in the 1920s, he came to lead a labor movement along race lines when he organized Pullman Porters into a union. The biggest political event of the decade, World War I, could also be viewed through a socialist lens. Randolph explained that foreign wars are a consequence, even an inevitable consequence, of capitalist exploitation. As we've seen, workers' wages are kept low enough that, as a class, they cannot afford to purchase the value of what they have produced. This leaves profit to be creamed off by the capitalists who do not do any work, but do own the means of production. What are they to do with all that extra wealth? Invest it, of course, often in speculative ventures in other lands, as the capitalists look for new opportunities of exploitation. That leads to conflict between the capitalists of various nations, as they compete with one another to reap further profits. Consistent with this analysis, Randolph staunchly opposed the world war, commenting that, wars of contending groups of capitalists are not the concern of the workers. He and his partner, Owen, were in fact arrested in an anti-war rally, but acquitted by a judge who didn't believe that Negroes could have produced the articulate propaganda they had been handing out. While this generally anti-war position was also adopted by white socialists, there was a more distinctive aspect of Randolph's critique. He railed against the hypocrisy of the American government, which claimed to be fighting for the cause of democracy, while refusing to offer freedom to some of its own citizens. As Randolph observed, black soldiers were sent to die in order to protect rights they did not enjoy something he rejected in no uncertain terms, no one should be loyal to any flag unless the flag is loyal to him. Ewart Harrison felt the same way. Speaking of loyalty, he said that if the World War had taught him anything, it was that white people are loyal to one concept above all others, and that was the concept of race. But the superiority claimed by the white race through warfare and exploitation is morally bankrupt. It amounts to nothing more than military and economic domination, which, as Harrison bitterly remarked, is what white men mean by civilization, disguise it how they may. As all this shows, socialism offered a powerful basis for understanding the social and economic plight of African Americans, but the implications were daunting. The problems of the race would be solved only through the full-scale revolution that uproots the capitalist system. Our protagonist did not mince words about this, Randolph said that prejudice, lynching, race riots, and so on would vanish only once the motive for promoting race prejudice is removed, namely profits. Harrison agreed that a great upheaval of American values was needed. After all, 
The ruling class has always determined what the social ideals and moral ideas of society should be, which is why both chattel and wage slavery have been taken for granted as divinely appointed. Similarly, would be argued that if socialism was impossible, this is only because people are used to the status quo and cannot imagine life under radically different political and economic arrangements. Here we see a position diametrically opposed to that of, say, Booker T. Washington. His whole idea was that members of his race should not reject but live up to the social ideals and moral ideas of American capitalism. They would achieve progress by showing that they are good citizens and hard workers. The socialists scornfully rejected this plan. To them it was delusional as well as unambitious to seek slow and steady advancement within a system that was designed to oppress all workers and black workers in particular. Harrison dismissed evidence of incremental improvement among the black community as an expression of intellectual viewpoints of the 18th century. He also published articles attacking Washington and his Tuskegee machine. The machine had its revenge by getting Harrison fired from a job at the post office, one that he very much needed to make ends meet. Fortunately, with his gifts of intellect and oratory, he was able to make money from speaking. Often, he delivered his addresses right out in the street, leading the New York News to compare him to Socrates. And like Socrates, Harrison risked alienating his audience with his views on religion. He did not introduce new gods, as Socrates was accused of doing, but he did adopt what he called agnosticism, openly embracing the anti-Christian aspect of the Marxist program. This was a risky move, given the deep piety of the African-American community in his day. Other socialists tried the opposite tactic, suggesting that socialism was, as W.A. Domingo put it, pure Christianity. Woodby went so far as to proclaim that both the Bible and socialism would agree that Marx was the greatest philosopher of modern times. But Woodby was certainly no conservative, and like Harrison, he aimed vigorous criticism at Booker T. Washington. Indeed, this is something pretty much all the socialists could agree on. Washington encouraged black people to take work as strike breakers, anything to find good employment. His program of industrial education was premised on the assumption that African Americans should enthusiastically offer their labor to the capitalists, and that this would gradually diminish race prejudice. Hence Washington's comment on the segregation of train cars, namely that a black man who helped make a railroad company rich would get a Pullman Palace car all for himself. But as we've seen, the socialists argued that race prejudice is rooted precisely in capitalism. So in fact, the more competitive black people became, the more this would stoke hatred among the white workers who are manipulated into thinking that difference in color trumps shared class. Among the strands of African-American thought of the time then, the Tuskegee project of industrial education was powerfully opposed by socialism. Its relations to the separatist nationalism of Marcus Garvey were more complicated. Harrison helped Garvey get his start in New York, and Garvey was a member of the Liberty League, an organization founded by Harrison. Later, Harrison would complain that Garvey copied his methods shamelessly, and Garvey would steal the spotlight too. He became a more prominent leader starting in about 1917, helped by the unpopularity of Harrison's open opposition to the war. Still today, Harrison is not nearly as well known as Garvey, even though he helped inspire a whole generation of African American thinkers, as recognized in 1919 when one magazine said that the infant spirit of the new Negro was nursed, cradled, and championed by Mr. Harrison. If this was a story of uneasy mentorship between Garvey and A. Philip Randolph, there was outright hostility. Randolph was particularly outraged when Garvey found common cause with white supremacists, who agree with him that the two races should separate from one another, and he called Garvey this supreme Negro jackass from Jamaica. This episode of scornful infighting was not unique. Randolph showed disdain toward a number of scholars he dubbed the old crowd, including Kelly Miller, Du Bois, and even T. Thomas Fortune. Harrison shared the low assessment of poor Miller in particular, pronouncing a speech by him pitiful for its scientific naivete and later calling Miller innocent of learning. But let's end on a more harmonious note by turning to the involvement of women activists in the socialist movement. We earlier mentioned Cyril Briggs, a socialist who founded an organization called the African Black Brotherhood in 1917. The treasurer of that organization, 
who's been credited with making its theoretical innovations and very survival possible, was Grace Campbell. She took on the logistical duties in the Brotherhood and later launched a further endeavor called the People's Educational Forum, a lecture series featuring such luminaries as Du Bois and William H. Ferris. Among white socialists, too, women were amongst the first to speak out in favor of finding common cause with black workers. Caroline Pemberton drew attention to the connections between race and class by saying that the dark skin of the Negro is the livery of the laboring class in the South. And Emma Riddle Singer said that if socialism meant discouraging African-American participation in activism, then she was not a socialist. This gives us an encouragement of our own to delve more deeply into the history of feminism in relation to Africana socialism and Marxism. And that's what we'll be doing next time as we're joined by an expert on this very topic. So, podcast listeners of the world, unite to join us for an interview with Vanessa Wills, next time here on The History of Africana Philosophy. <music>